Voilà, madame, messieurs, vous avez évidemment euh, des, des, des micros. Installez-vous. Si vous en êtes d'accord, puisque euh, après tout, nous sommes, euh, j'allais dire, entre nous, on va, on, je vous appellerai par vos prénoms, ça vous va Hein Christian, Maya et Sigurd. Je vais commencer avec vous, euh, Sigurd, tout de suite. Euh, on I'll va start with you, Sigurd. profiter de votre okay, we'll take advantage of your presence here to uh, start with the, uh, the end of Nicola uh, Therese's presentation in Basel and uh, those potential ratios and uh, the challenges today. The Basel challenges in, on banks, uh, it is said, and we can see this when we follow the sector, those are really major challenges. And when, if you agree with us, let us actually share a macroeconomic uh, uh, item here. I would like to take uh, uh, Christian Siegel Mariatik's presence uh, 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 into consideration and talk about the economic situation, because if banks need to finance the turnaround process and the, econo the economy, we need to agree on uh, what the situation is like today. You have the floor, perhaps, for this very rapid uh, comment on those criteria. The microphone. Parlez, parlez dans le micro. Speak in the voilà. I will uh, try to speak French today. So, first of all, <coughs> we have uh, been going through some uh, really difficult times uh, for some time now, uh, first with COVID and then with the Ukraine. However, it really now is time uh, to implement uh, and I have uh, four main points that I want to, to share with you today. The first of these is that uh, we need uh, to um, base our diagnosis of uh, what happened, uh, on what really happened in 2008 in uh, the US and elsewhere. The second point is that we need a dynamic approach based on uh, the questions, uh, the, the real doubts, uh, questions that banks have. And thirdly, you, we must have um, proper rules for competition for banks that are within countries and for banks in other countries. The fourth matter, which is the argument made by the president and the Ecken group. We need to find uh, the right compromise between stability and growth in uh, the global financial system. So firstly, I would say that uh, there are many different diagnostic methods that uh, tell us that the losses in the financial system in Europe is not linked to uh, uh, housing uh, uh, mortgages, mortgage loans, uh, as in the US. So this means that we don't uh, necessarily need uh, the same protective methods in Europe as in the US. Another point of consideration is that there was a mandate but from the uh, G20, uh, we must ensure that there is representation in uh, that capital is significant. We must ensure that the system that we are proposing, that the system that we are proposing uh, handles real risks in the system. And uh, thirdly, that uh, different uh, banks in different countries are on an equal footing. La première proposition I would say that the first uh, uh, proposals uh, 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 have been, we've been working on for a long time. This is based on a number of studies. I think the proposal from the Commission is certainly better. Uh, it, certainly, if it is uh, given, uh, certainly, if the means are allocated to the banks uh, that really need uh, 
uh, this uh, support. So I think uh, the proposal really is headed in the right direction. And then I would say, lastly, and, and perhaps the most important point is the question of how we find a balance between growth and stability. There are a great number of studies now that show that uh, at the time when a bank in a country where, it is, uh, where the country is functioning normally, if, if that figure goes over 15 percent, there is no increase in stability. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, if you force banks to increase their capital ratio, the costs of finance will be far, far higher. And so it makes absolutely no sense to force banks that are already solid and stable to increase their uh, capital ratio. Uh, it's it, the CBI, uh, the uh, FBF, uh, they all agree w with this point. Uh, when uh, you're uh, setting up in Europe, what we want, what you want to look at when you're considering Europe, what, uh, are we forcing uh, the banks uh, to do this? And it, are these banks that are already well capitalized? And really, this is um, not about a compromise. We simply need to see if uh, the if issue is really, uh, you know, the consequences is this is this really leading to uh, the banks that need this additional support. So, thank you very much um, for that. I see that Maya Atik has uh, made some notes, and if I can, may just bounce banks. I. Uh, uh, found a sort of red thread, uh, finding the right balance in what you said, uh, the, right, the right balance between stability and growth. Uh, I think you said this several times, uh, Maya and uh, Christian. Can you uh, tell us, uh, Christian, please go ahead, the microphone should be on. Excellent. Just uh, a couple of points uh, before I begin. I'm perhaps a little less brave than Sigur. I'm, you might call me cautious, but uh, please forgive me. I will be speaking English. I could try to do it in French, but uh, it would certainly be more amusing uh, than it would be um, enlightening. And so uh, I, I have to say it took me 15 minutes to make that decision. And so I will now switch to English. Challenges. And that's not only the banks, that all of us, the societies. And the, Europe, and the solutions to these challenges, in my view, there are European solutions. And that is what we're going to talk about today. And in order to come to good results on European level, we need to cooperate. Foremost, Germany and France need to cooperate. I can tell you that on the level of the banks, the French and the German banks, we really live that. It's only a week ago that Nicolas Thierry and my president, Christian Seving, the CEO from Deutsche Bank, they had a joint meeting or joint conversation with the German chancellery, for example. We do that on a very regular basis. We have an ability to compromise, and that is what Europe needs. Now, I don't want to be too much of kind of sending statesman, statesman messages up front, but I would like to thank Nicola, Maya, Etienne, and the entire team of the EBF for that excellent cooperation, which works well, and I must say, it's also fun. Now, back to your questions. Um, and I was listening to what Sigo said very carefully. I think as far as the economic situation is concerned, the situation is worse than many observers think. We have an extraordinary situation here where a number of unrelated different crises come on top of each other. And I would say that the economic models that the ECB and other institutes run, they are not able to reflect properly the risks we are facing. And I could start with the topic of inflation. Um, Looking at growth first, it has to be said, and that is what the Commission actually announced yesterday, most European countries are still below, below the level of GDP that we have seen before the pandemic, right? Unlike the United States, where we see inflation, they had seen significant growth. Here in Europe, we are still below the level we had seen pre-pandemic. And yet we have the very high inflation rate. Um, 
7%, 7% plus, and what's more worrying, an inflation rate that is likely to stay with us. The outlook for next year is not encouraging. It's 3% plus, significantly above the target level of the ECB. In my view, that requires decisive action. We have seen the Fed acting um, by increasing rates by a speed that we have not seen for 20 years. And if I read the signals, the European Central Bank is also talking about increasing rates in their meeting in July. My message here is very clear. An increase of rates by 25 basis points is not enough. We need a very clear, strong signal. We need to leave negative rate territory. And that is my appeal. The European Central Bank needs to increase rates by 50 basis points so that by this summer, at least, mm -hmm. we have left negative rate territory. Mm. Merci beaucoup, Christian Hussig. Je, je, je vais passer la parole à Maya Attic. Alors, je reviendrai sur ce que vous avez dit. On a... Thank you very, very much uh, for this, uh, uh, Christian. I will come back to uh, this point uh, uh, about an increase in uh, 25 uh, base points, which you're saying is not sufficient. But if I may uh, turn uh, to you, uh, Maya, uh, we had... Uh, we've heard from these uh, two other speakers on stability and growth, on... Uh, rates, and uh, if I may introduce you perhaps uh, more generally, you are the uh, General Director of the French Banking Federation. Tell us what your assessment is of the French macroeconomic situation, please. Thank you so much. Uh, let me thank also our guests uh, for sharing this panel uh, with me. It's true that I am lucky to be the only one here uh, speaking my mother tongue with Eric, of course, so we have a much easier job of it. But, um, if I can uh, explain uh, the uh, things that need to be done in order to fund and finance this growth. At the end of the day, we are dealing with a great deal of uncertainty, lots of uh, unexpected events that have, uh, as we've been saying, uh, come on top of uh, one another. Monetary policy, which is obviously having uh, an important, a significant impact on uh, uh, the banking situation. Uh, we talk about uh, the Basel regulations a lot, but there are lots and lots of other regulations that affect the banking sector. And what we're uh, uh, seeing is that uh, uh, the, these uh, rules and these regulations uh, that uh, Ms. Tinegli of the European Commission was saying earlier, uh, all of these are very, very cumbersome at the end of the day when you look at all of uh, the things uh, that need to be uh, adhered to. So in giving a loan to a, a company for instance, the number of documents that have to be uh, requested and obtained, um, uh, taking into account the risk and also management of this loan throughout the life of uh, the loan. There are lots of rules, uh, not just obli obligations in terms of capital, uh, uh, liquidity, cash flow, risk management, and so on and so forth. So all of this is uh, extremely cumbersome. And obviously, the role of banks is to integrate all of this. Their function, uh, the function of banks at the end of the day, is as uh, an integrator. This has been uh, refreshed. This is a strategic role, integrating all of these countless rules in order to perform their uh, service uh, rather than uh, re 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 rounding uh, the edges, as it were. And so the, the purpose of uh, French banking, banking, which has a different uh, model to to, uh, to, to, to German banks, for instance. Our role is to uh, uh, depend on our uh, stability and, in all, and, and use that in order to offer uh, as many services as possible to uh, uh, as many clients, uh, these different uh, cl uh, clients. And so there is this uh, very uh, intricate uh, system of how this all uh, fits together across uh, branches, customers, uh, large accounts, small accounts, individuals. 
individuals, uh, companies, uh, loans, uh, mortgages, and so on. How do we integrate all of these calculations, all of the rules and regulations that apply, and continue doing our business? And so what I'm trying to say is that we cannot reduce this, as well as the Basel transition, uh, to a purely technical issue. There are political dimensions. Yes, absolutely. Can I ask you a question? Um, we can see that banks are being asked to have uh, real-life uh, uh, stress tests, uh, full-scale tests, stress tests for some time. And we've seen also uh, a Brexit, which has impacted uh, the robustness of banks. We have uh, the health crisis. We have the war in Ukraine. We can, you know, we're, these are real-life uh, full-scale uh, stress, stress tests. Yes, Nicolas Thierry said this earlier. We are all uh, living through uh, these situations of real stress and banks. And actually, what we have to do is to allow ourselves not only to be uh, driven by the rules, which of course have to be adhered to at all times, but really what is the purpose, what is our real purpose to be, uh, let me answer that, to be useful when it is necessary. There is an old adage that says, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to give someone a, an umbrella when it stops raining. It's absolute, This is what we must absolutely avoid. We have to work in partnership and be uh, together, work uh, uh, in a cooperative fashion. And this is why it's so important uh, for us to have uh, 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 representatives of German uh, banking here and, and others, precisely so that we can contrast and look at how we have accompanied growth in the past in our, our different uh, business areas and at the same time uh, abide by the rules that uh, do need to evolve. You uh, have called it uh, the uh, Basel regulations with the, the famous prudential ratio. There's a, a strong uh, competition, of course, uh, compared uh, to uh, the uh, Americans. But we'll also, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Sigors what's ever his opinion. He was saying that uh, interest uh, rates, real interest rates are in negative territory. They have to go into a positive uh, territory. He was saying that uh, 25 base points is not going to be enough. Uh, Christine Lagarde uh, said uh, recently that we're looking at two further increases. But the uh, question for uh, the uh, economist and uh, the heads of uh, uh, German banking is that we are in a situation of stagflation. We have very low uh, growth, uh, close to zero in France, and inflation that is uh, growing. So we we, we reduce interest to, uh, in, to, 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 to get the recovery, uh, and, and we would do the opposite uh, for another aim. So how we, we can't do both at the same time. Are you sure that uh, 20 for plus 25 percent uh, in interest isn't going to, to break down uh, and was a problem in, in Germany? Well, we are witnessing, we can call that stagflation. And I see policymakers are very reluctant to use that expression. But if I look at European growth, if I look at German growth, we see very low growth this year, but that is mainly a statistical effect from last year. So bottom line, there's hardly any growth in Europe this year, and we see, as we discussed before, very high inflation. Now you say, what about increasing rates in an, in an environment of low growth? My response to that would be, the ECB has other means to foster growth than through negative rates. And in fact, we have seen that negative rates have not had an impact much on helping growth, especially as, and I have to underline, negative rates do not have a big impact on fostering growth. When I say ECB has other means, I'm referring especially to targeted purchase programs. Um, now, right now, the ECB stay, says they want to stop purchase programs first and then um, leave negative rate territory. But we have the purchase programs, and they could be reactivated if the economic situation needs it. And my second point, and I stop here, um, inflation and growth. What we see right now is that consumers across Europe are losing confidence, and that is hurting economic growth significantly. Consumers are losing confidence because of the high inflation you're witnessing. So fighting inflation means also bringing consumer confidence back, and by that, helping economic growth. 
Merci beaucoup de ce point de vue intéressant. Uh, Sigur, maybe you have to practice your language Merci. now. It's uh, the only way for, for improving. Uh, Est-ce que vous partagez le, le point de vue de, de Christian aussi Et Do you share the opinion of uh, Christian aussi And before we get back to Barton, do you agree that uh, there are a lot of things in common between the, the French and German uh, situations? Uh, in Germany, uh, the driver is exports, whereas in France, it is the consumption by households. Uh, let me... Uh, those are the drivers of the economy in these respective countries. Rather than Voltaire, I think I will increase the precision of remarks. I think we should go back to um, the economic situation prior to COVID, uh, both in the United States and Europe. In fact, at the time, if you look at standard inflation rates, uh, wage inflation, so on and so forth, they would probably have merited already the time interest rates that were 100 or 200 point basis points above the level at the time. And you can ask yourself why interest rates were not raised well before. Clearly, they were not being raised through the period of COVID for many reasons, but we had already relatively high inflation, both in the US and in Europe, compared to a situation of negative interest rates. Uh, there's been a lot of study of so-called normal interest rates, and they have never been in negative territory. Uh, yet with the wage inflation in Europe was close to 2%. So we are starting from a position where both the ECD and the Fed, I think, has been significantly behind the curve. Now, the, the situation, the discussion now in the US is about uh, the president of the Fed power going out and say we need to have to increase rates above the so-called natural rates. That is rates about three, 400 basis points way above where we are now in Europe. That goes then back to, um, yes, but how does that fit into the economic situation we have? No, let me put that in two different perspectives, the effect on GDP and the discussion we had on the Basel. First on GDP, there is a lot of studies showing, and here I completely support what Christian is saying, when you go into negative territory and you also look at other parts of bank regulation, it's not clear at all that it actually helps banks finance. First of all, because in most of Europe, the negative interest rates have not been passed on in deposit rates. So the banks are actually absorbing these costs. Secondly, you have the liquidity requirements that forces banks to hold some of the deposits in safe assets. What is return on safe assets? Negative. So you are really punishing banks very hard, and there's only one place that can get their money back if they don't want to go bankrupt. That is by increasing either the, uh, the, the rates they are requiring when they're financing things or being more cautious in the lending. So there are several studies that show on the margin that you go into negative territory, it has zero positive effect. On the other hand, if you're looking at how financial markets have developed over the last four or five years, it has certainly not increased stability. So I think when you look at the two goals for, for a central bank, it is helping growth by controlling inflation and creating long-term stability. So my perspective, and I'm completely clear on this, negative interest rate does not help growth, and it clearly cr creates the conditions for instability long term. So just a few words here on, the, on what is the link here within the parcel. Now, if you're going to increase interest rate with, let's say, one, 200 basis points over the last next one or two years in Europe, will that not increase losses, for example, in the, in the, in the financial sector, and will not require more capital? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm saying here, we have two elements in banking relation. We have the pillar one and the pillar two. So I think the long-term Basel EAB regulation needs to focus on the long term. If national authorities, bank by bank, is concerned about losses in a situation of higher interest rates, they have the pillar two and they have stress tests to make sure that uh, the, the immediate impact is uh, not leading to bank problems. So that's, uh, that's my view. Mm. Alors, euh, on va revenir évidemment euh, sur Bâle et la réglementation. We will come back to this uh, matter of uh, Bâle and uh, growth, and uh, we had this question also about uh, the drivers uh, be, uh, of the economy being different in uh, France and uh, Germany. What we also need to take into account is that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Feb has a um, 
growth target. But um, Mayati, let me ask you, uh, when we're looking at uh, our French uh, uh, public, it's very different to uh, what happens uh, in uh, Germany. But when we're asking the question, who can finance uh, a turnaround in the economy or, or an economic recovery, he can inject uh, some liquidity when we're going well beyond uh, the Maastricht uh, criteria. And it's obviously true what uh, Sigurd said. There are a lot of regulations, uh, Basel uh, just being one example. But do these regulations uh, reduce an interest level uh, that would support the work of companies? So one uh, euro uh, uh, that gets uh, uh, stuck for whatever reason, but for the capital deposits or other, that means 15 euros lost in the economy. These prudential ratios are ultimately uh, stopping uh, a little bit, perhaps even very much, preventing banks from investing in the economic recovery. I think there are lots of people here from the authorities, representing the authorities, that would disagree and that would say the distribution of uh, credit has been very, very dynamic in France, especially over the last 10 years or so. Uh, uh, and this has contributed to French uh, growth. We, again, are the country where uh, uh, home uh, owner loans are amongst the highest in Europe. We're also the country where the uh, rate of acceptance of loans uh, by companies from the smallest to uh, the largest is, again, the highlight, highest. This uh, goes uh, beyond uh, uh, 85 to 90% uh, even. And so, yes, there are rules, and uh, yet they are implemented, they're applied, and growth is continuing. Uh, so there's no problem. But I would say the reality is different. This is not true. Uh, regulations force us to make choices. And so what this means is that there are uh, segments, sectors uh, that, uh, of the, the economy that are no longer served. So you will focus on the national um, uh, uh, market or sector. You may be focused on particular clients, certain, some of them, but not others. And you may have to uh, choose to or be forced to uh, give up uh, profitability. And so the f a lot of uh, organizations are highlighting the issue of profitability because ultimately, if your capital is immobilized on uh, activity that is not very profitable. This is seen in the overall uh, balance sheet. And so uh, from a purely econometric uh, point of view, examining the rules and the impact on loans, it's difficult to prove uh, uh, clearly that this is the case unless you also look at other economic areas. For instance, growth in the US is very, very different. And obviously the fact that uh, Credit loans, credit is managed differently over there, and I'm thinking uh, specifically of uh, uh, housing. Uh, and, and the fact that these loans don't spend uh, don't uh, spend time long, very long in the banking sector, it quickly uh, moves on over there. Uh, whereas here, it, it tends to stay. These are uh, clear elements in our model that differ and that lead to uh, limits uh, uh, after a certain amount of time. And so, in other words, the assessment I think that we can make of this, and we will continue looking at this throughout the day. We will have to look at this market by market and type of activity by type of activity according to our needs. And uh, the analysis uh, done by uh, Copenhagen Economics uh, shows that uh, uh, residential housing, the financial markets, uh, uh, there is a real future uh, risk for the future. And there are impacts that have already been seen in terms of changes in recent years. So, but just a very simple figure, perhaps we will talk about this a little later in another of the panels. One figure that illustrates this gap uh, in competition between countries is that in 2009, the first American bank was roughly the, the number one uh, US uh, bank in terms of uh, stock market value, it was roughly the same size as uh, the European counterpart. Uh, and in the US, nowadays, the number one bank in the US is uh, the equivalent to the sum total of 11, the top 11 banks in the Eurozone. And this difference in potential is seen 
see not only in uh, the uh, staggering decline in the number of loans, but also in the growth. Uh, and this is because we have very, very different, and uh, this is why the rules uh, must change. Now, that's the point. I mean, so far as competition, and I'll use the, this because we just talked about it, but uh, bank, uh, well, competition in, between European and American banks with uh, different prudential rates, and Mayati was actually referring to, the, uh, to this quite uh, rightfully. Credits uh, and loans are not actually inscribed in the uh, balance sheet as they are in Europe. And uh, securitization of derivatives of products in the, in the subprime crisis, uh, those were very complex, hence this um, incredible financial crisis. Uh, Christian, uh, now the difference between American banks and the same uh, questions you used to ask, and European banks, is that difference? Or does that, is that difference neutral? I mean, we're just playing with the same ball, the same rules, the same dimensions, or uh, uh, we're not running as fast in Europe? Competitiveness of European banks. Um, and that's also a question of European sovereignty. That is what Europe, Brussels, talks a lot about, strategic sovereignty. The, largest initial public offering or um, secondary market offering, equity stocks being sold in Germany this year, the largest transaction is led purely by American banks. There is no German, no European bank in the lead of that offering. And Europe, and we have learned that also on the back of this energy dependency on Russia, we have to ask ourselves, is it the right decision to rely to a large extent on foreign banks from a European perspective, we talk about financial services. Um, if we talk about Basel, and I just in the last couple of days, I had a number of exchanges with US policymakers. We talk a lot about Basel because it leads to significant capital increases in Europe, in France and in Germany. American policymakers, American banks are not, Basel is not very high on the agenda. They're gonna implement Basel only for the very large banks, and they're going to implement it after we have implemented it. So they're going to look at what is Europe doing, and then they kind of will calibrate something that suits them. And as I said, I have to underline it, with little impact on US banks. And, that the, and the Basel compromise that is on the table right now, it is a compromise, it is a result that harms Europe. It does not harm US banks, and we could go back to 2016 and ask ourselves, why is that the situation? What went wrong there? Why did Europe not negotiate with a single voice? Instead, as ever so often, there were a number of different European interests at the table. Um, but I would like, before finishing that, if I, if I may, leave also with you with a positive um, reflection here. And that is, the banks are at the side of their clients. We have seen that in the last two years of the pandemic, and that is also our mission, and that is what we are working for all day long. We want to be also at the side of our clients in the future. I can, tell, I can tell you that is not easy for a number of reasons. And to be very clear, we said competitiveness with the US. We were talking about Basel. There is a shortage of capital within banks. I hear European banks telling me that they have to decline business, client requests, because there is not sufficient capital. Now, we are talking about implementing a Basel proposal that even if we use this good compromise that the Commission has put on the table, will lead to a double-digit percentage, 10% or so capital increase in Europe. That will increase capital shortage, and it's not only Basel. Brussels, the single resolution authority, is collecting 80 billion into a single resolution fund. That is 80 billion capital withdrawn from the European banking system. And I could go on and on, and I will, would like to conclude, thank you, Maya, with one reflection. I spoke the other day to a very large US investor, blue chip, not a hedge fund, someone that really, with a very long perspective, owns stocks all around the world. It's, it's US pension money. And they sold large position in European banks. You could see that in the share price of European banks in the last few weeks. Asking them, why are they executing, exiting European banks? They did not say, oh, European banks, you do not control your costs. You do not understand digitalization. None of that. They said, you guys in Europe, you lack the backing of your policy makers, of your supervisors. And we are entering in a world where capital is going to be 
a very important criteria for competitiveness, and you're not gonna be on the winning side. That is why this investor, large US investor, and you could read about that in the news, not the reason why they're exiting, exiting but that they're exiting, they're exiting because they doubt our competitiveness, and they, their main argument is not management capabilities, it's really it's the policy environment European banks are operating on. That's not a good result for us, Maya, I must say. Huh? Because our job is to create a policy environment that makes European banks successful and also attractive from an investor's point of view. And if I may, one very last point. The same investors tell me, you European banks have an issue with capital. But not that you have too little capital. Your issue is you have too much capital. I, I, I leave it at that. Merci, Christian. Uh, Sigurd Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Sigurd Schmidt. When I listen to Christian Olesig, I have the impression that he's pretty clear about uh, the level playing field. Now, does that mean that we, uh, that the geographical zones of the United States and Europe, for instance, uh, would actually head toward uh, financial independence? How can you uh, respond to uh, those very relevant questions from Christian? Microphone. Divided into to two uh, questions. The first one is about the ability for the EU to have really a common financial market. So that at least two questions here. There is, do we have a common banking market? No, we don't. There are a number of different barriers to actually creating a, um, a common a banking market. A lot of regulations in this area, and there is a lot to look at. So look at this. Secondly. Um, I've also been involved in a lot of work in uh, venture capital and, and private equity markets. And it's remarkable that EU increasingly have a number of places also with EU, with the UK now out of it, who have strong uh, capital markets for financing um, VC markets. We have a strong position in Berlin. We have a very strong position in, uh, in Stockholm and some other places, yet, we see again and again when we go to late state financing, the firms go to US because we don't have the deepness in capital markets to take really large successful firms to the markets in Europe. So I think that, and that is ultimately the only way to create a viable uh, financial um, situation in Europe is that we, we create conditions under which you big uh, venture capital funds, private equity funds, and also banks can create the critical mass and scale to serve the clients all the way. You can easily do that with smaller firms, but if you really want to take large, successful companies to the market that you have to rely again and again on going to the US, is for me a symbol of we have not created a deep financial market in Europe that can serve the growing firms all the way. Therefore, we have no strong investment banks in Europe that can compete with anything they have. The same with some of the big stock markets. So that we need to deal with. The second point is about leveling playing field in the implementation of Basel. Yeah. And I think there's around 15, 20 banks in total in the US who are using internal uh, EIB models. Why? Only 15, first of all, probably because they have losses at a level where they will not have any benefits of thinking about EIB, that you can think about why, why we're moving into this in the first place. They have never really reformed the two big institutions who are the major players in creating the, the, the crisis in the US, the first one, namely Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Still basically unreformed. And yet we are now discussing implementing a Basel that is creating a situation where we are not increasing the alignment between real risks and the prudential requirements in Europe. So I think here we should, I mean, from an European perspective, go back to what I said before. Clearly, if there are banks who are insufficiently capitalized to cover the reasonable risk going forward, they should increase capital. But the problem is with some of the proposals going forward, they're not doing that. They are imposing higher capital requirements of banks who doesn't need more capital for potential reasons. That is bank for bank stability, is bank for growth. In particular, it's very bad for Europe to start saying we, by what we mean by equal treatment is that we treat equal, we treat, we treat different risks equally. We need a system where we trade equal risks 
equally. Mm -hmm. And that is, the, that is the only way you can create a, a, a level playing field. And that is not what we are going to do. We are going to create an unlevel playing field between Europe as a whole and US. And we are going to create a lot of unlevel playing fields inside countries and, in, and between countries in Europe. That cannot be the foundation for something that serves growth and stability. So conclusions, please create a really strong financial market, both the capital market union and the banking union. That's the only way you can get the big banks and the big institutions that can serve large clients in, in, if in the EU all the way. And level playing fields means globally treating equal risks equally from all kinds of different potential relations. Level playing field, uh, Maya, I, I think. Uh, uh, Maya, now uh, put the concept uh, uh, on the table here. As he goes, I realize they got into the idea. In other words, this concept, uh, is that, uh, has, does that have any echo? Does it make any sense to be really on an equal pedestal with the same ball and, uh, uh, and the same... Uh, uh, Gates and, uh, and so on and so forth. Yes, when uh, the Bank Federation, the French for Bank Federation, and then uh, the European Bank Federation worked uh, on the uh, objectives uh, of the new uh, European legislature and European mandate, the sovereignty related issue actually popped up uh, quite a number of times with very practical uh, impacts in Europe. We're, we're not saying there should not be non European stakeholders gaining market shares in Europe. No, this is not at all the issue. The issue is to have similar constraints, the same constraints for the same types of activities and not have those uh, differences in values and mortgages for unjustified reasons. And for European stakeholders to be strong, we need to struggle against this uh, uh, European fragmentation, what we call fragmentation in the, our lingo, in this lingo. What do we mean by that? We mean that the uh, stakeholder situation is considered on a country level and uh, on an entity level rather than uh, uh, considering the single uh, loan market or credit market. And this objective of a loan and credit market well, has been an objective for quite a long time. When I started out my career, the, there was French presidents here, took over the speech made by the French president, Laurent Fabius at the time, uh, minister of the economy and the finances, and his speech was incredible on the union of markets, market unions, and this uh, bank, uh, Europe, banking Europe, and the need for a strong banking and financial Europe. On the other hand, competitiveness was not as relevant because uh, the top of the list priority people thought was to unify the market with similar rules. And I think that's a moment where we should look quickly at the project banking union. Why? Because it is at the table in Brussels. The chair of Eurogroup, the Irish finance minister, Don Yu, is really... It's a, it's a major effort that he's undertaking for months, right? And we're all asking ourselves, is he going to yield anything? With our, but it's, it's very high on the agenda, banking union. Now, I said in the beginning the solutions are in Europe. How, can I, how could I possibly speak out against banking union? I'm not going to do that. But I have to say for us, banking union is about what Maya just described. It should be about market integration. It should be about not having 27 markets with their own set of rules. It should be a market where capital liquidity can move freely. We do not have that in financial services. And it's, a, it's really funny, if you look back, there were reports, Giovannini reports, 20, 30 years back in securities markets, etc. There, there has been hardly any progress. We have to acknowledge that. Now, banking union is on the table in Brussels, but it's not about market integration. And we have to say, as much as I'm in favor of advancing Europe and I'm in favor of completing banking union, I have to be disappointed because there's nothing really meaningful in there in terms of market integration. And I would urge policymakers to really be more ambitious and braver on that. There are other aspects in there. The third pillar of the banking union, deposit insurance. We know that is connected. All these issues on the table are somehow connected. And a number of smaller member states say we need deposit insurance in order to accept market integration. I'm not entirely sure I understand the logic, but I see that's a political necessity. There is crisis management on the table. 
resolution mechanism on European level that is not bringing us any benefits. And that's not going to bring any benefits to consumers. And there is a question of risk reduction on the table. I know it has been an issue where the German administration has used a lot of political capital for. I'm not too sure whether we really need much risk reduction if we do not have deposit insurance. Bottom line, and I would like to use a number that um, Sigurd actually calculated. You, a couple of years ago, produced a research paper which says there are 95 billion efficiency gains to be made by integrating European financial markets. 95 billion. Now is the moment to address that issue. And the good news about the Russian-Ukrainian situation is there is momentum on European level. We should use the momentum to make progress in the areas where it's most needed and it's areas that ultimately will facilitate the situation of funding of corporates in Europe. And I guess many of the people here today represent corporates. And I really have to warn you, we are coming out of a period where funding, financing, lending has not been an issue. And if I read the science correctly, bank capital and with that bank funding will be a shortage going forward. Sigurs, j'aimerais avoir votre avis. I would like to get uh, your take on this. When I hear uh, my take on Christian or Sieg, I have, I have the feeling that uh, the German French bank a couple are really talking through one single mouthpiece. Uh, good for the uh, for the setup of a unique uh, European banking uh, sector, uh, 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 banking union, a single European banking union, and we're really uh, seeing the restructuring of uh, stock markets in Europe. To you. Is this an interesting phase before the integration and before the banking union in Europe, which uh, Madame Matiga and Monsieur Osig are actually seeking? Your microphone. I think it's, it's always uh, uh, fortunate if uh, uh, two strong actors uh, do something together that will serve the wider EU interest, as long as it serves the wider EU interest. I think it does. I think also there are a number of my perspective, purely political connections between what you want from a banking union and what actually is essential to create a common markets. Um, and that is discussing around deposit. I think I share some of the points that you are making, Christian. Uh, and whether one then at the end of the day needs to make some compromises on things you don't really disagree with in order to get that, we'll see when it comes to that point. But the, the simple fact is that Europe needs larger financial institutions in a number of different segments. It can be capital markets, it can be large banking uh, transactions, and that will not be created unless banks have a market they can serve that has sufficient critical scale for them to compete. And for me, it's not about we need to compete against the Americans. I mean, that's, that's, that's a kind of a a schoolboy game. It's about serving the, the customers in Europe, and we're not able to do that unless we create a, a banks and other financial institutions that are able to serve clients at a much more uh, European-wide scale, in particular larger uh, clients. So I agree completely uh, on that part. Um, so don't make it a, a contest between one continent and another continent. Just focus on what Europe needs, and it's about banking and capital market union. I also think that there is sometimes a wrong discussion of saying, well, Europe is currently using much more banking finance, where the US is using much more capital markets. I think the important thing is not necessarily that, well, it, what does it, what what purpose does it serve that firms can also go to the capital markets and not banks, are banks not then losing business? I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I know there's also some very large French banks we had discussions with who see a role for securitization, smart securitization, not the American one, that can actually help firms getting access to, to funds. So I think the whole issue of how do we have an integrated financial sector, a large banking sector, a well-functioning capital markets, and sophisticated investors, pension funds, and so on and so forth, who knows how to uh, acquire these products. So it's a whole financial ecosystem that is far too fragmented uh, in Europe. That we need to focus on, and there are a lot of things we can do, and has been identified many times what you need to do. So it's a, <laughs> the political will to, to carry that through. And if that, again, coming back to the question, can be supported by two of the largest countries in Europe uh, pushing it ahead, so much, Samaria. 
Alors, Maya, Maya Attic, bon. Euh, Maya, now I would like us to perhaps get to uh, this uh, starting point because Sigurd actually mentioned this quite a number of times uh, the link between uh, the right balance and uh, growth and stability. Now, a few minutes ago, you also you were referring to Basel and you said, okay, from a technical standpoint, you explained what it was all about for those who did not know, but you also had this message. You said, that this is also a political a message. Now, are we getting back to the starting point and uh, the uh, red uh, thread? Stability and growth. I mean, where uh, should we be, uh, where should we draw the line? Madame Tidengeli actually talked about it, and Galateri also referred to that issue. In other words, this is uh, the very essence of our work. And insofar as Basel, as well as other issues, ignorance and uh, fear are the worst enemies. And ignorance and fear in uh, the prudential sector uh, would be about the following. In other words, being very much very scared about those complex rules and say it's way too complicated. We're going to say it aside Get, and uh, uh, rely on the uh, great experts and calculations will be the way they are and economy will pay. Now, I believe that the approach we got here in uh, the bank sector and in the dialogue we're having with all of our partners is as follows. If uh, the purpose of the objective of the uh, Basel Transplantation Europe is about uh, making a carbon copy of what is being done on an international level because rules have, were subject to negotiations on an international level by a circle of government. And uh, with the political mandate and term, uh, general term, uh, uh, defined by G20, uh, by heads of states and governments, ministers of finance, and uh, they said this should not actually give way to significant increase in uh, requirements. So this was the framework. Those were technical rules with a mandate, which uh, Sigurds referred to a few minutes ago. Now, if you say, OK, transplantation, we take the Basel rules and say, OK, we make carbon copies, great, we got this in Europe, great. Now, we just miss, miss up. Uh, the balance is about saying, okay, what are the uh, public political objectives, the public political ideas is to finance growth. It's uh, uh, the financial independence, which, which once again is not about uh, ex, uh, having extra European uh, stakeholders exit, but have uh, competitive equality. We, we should serve multiple markets, and it's about also not having any borders within bank groups and borders depending on countries. So actually, at the end of the day, when you're having a look at the way which the European Commission and states and the European Parliament are going to be negotiating around those different points, we need to be highly attentive. Are they complying with the general mandate of not increasing requirements? And is it well done for each one of the countries and for each one of the banks, not on a European average level? This is important. So how how should we work things out for the result to be in line with the mandate? And how should we um, uh, uh, take uh, French specificities into account and still be faithful to the international text? But one cannot just say the objective is to actually tick all the boxes. No, the objective is to tick uh, the growth-related boxes, com competition-related boxes, uh, stakeholder financing-related boxes, and uh, this bank relational-related boxes, which we cherish quite particularly. Christian Sieg was uh, looking at me. I don't know whether he wanted to get a message across to me, but I know, forgive me, but I can hear I, I hear you. Uh, my, uh, I hear you, but there are uh, budgetary situations, and might, they might be different from one place to another in the setup of uh, the euro currency. Uh, well, uh, at the time, well, each country signed uh, criteria in Maastricht at the time, uh, deficit-related criteria, debt criteria, and those criteria. Now, every year, we just keep saying, OK, we're now proposing a budgetary uh, pathway in France, for example, for 2027, and we're going to be make sure to German friends that we're going to be sticking to those criteria, and that we're going to be uh, really uh, uh, really sticking to this because uh, the euro uh, robustness is at stake. So um, allow me this question to my, my aunt Christian. I would like to take advantage of his presence to ask him the question on the German side and the reaction from Sigurd. Well, well, we're not expressing, we're not being vocal on uh, behalf of the entire prof profession. I'll be, I'll, I'll really speak on my own behalf, and I'm quite familiar with those topics. What, the very interesting part of those processes is we started off in very simple criteria, defined at a time when we had the feeling that we were heading in a stable uh, direction. Uh, now, with years passing by, 
uh, well, states in sense would not. I mean, the states did not change their minds. Circumstances have changed. And uh, the fact that all the economists uh, uh, observed that life was a lot more complicated than a textbook. Uh, uh, and uh, while we, uh, uh, including those uh, structural growth related issues, issues that are. Let me just use a very simple example. Uh, the, the very simple difference between Germany and uh, France. Two differences. One is the structure of the economies, which we referred to a few minutes ago, between the industry, services, exports, consumption, investment. Now, this uh, changes the uh, evaluation of a given figure. And then the issue related to demography and the evolution of uh, uh, active uh, population dynamics. And this is not the same uh, you know, having uh, different debt levels. I mean, might actually entail different uh, conclusions or uh, generate different conclusions. So what are those? What well, this process uh, shows us, uh, this process became more and more complex. Uh, I'm talking about the process around uh, 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 the Stability and Growth Pact or agreement. It shows that we need to be agile in uh, uh, implementing this uh, process. We need to whistle and say, hey, uh, raise the red flag and say, let's uh, put this, uh, let's, halt, let's stop. But we cannot really play the ostrich and ignore those complex realities. In the next panel, we'll probably be talking talking about the fact that with all those public financial constraints, the relationship between public financing and private financing for those major transitional challenges which we're all experiencing has to be done. This is paramount, so stability and growth rules, whether those rules exist or not. So public money will not suffice and private money will not suffice in the face of what we need to, uh, we're going to be uh, going through. Because you know, see, with, regard, with regards to this budgetary situation, the new uh, German chancellor, uh, budgetary uh, rigor, is that what is going to say, or I'm going to make an effort to perhaps reprocess those uh, German uh, surpluses uh, within the European system. What is uh, the German Chancellor's position? He is really trying to uh, drive a wedge between us. Well, there's a strong link between the budgetary question as well as the role of banks. Why have has the fiscal situation in many European countries deteriorated? To absorb the effects of the pandemic. And in my point of view, that was the right decision. Because the pandemic, we always knew it's kind of, it should be temporary in nature. We are not done with it, but at some point we will be done with it. Um, the situation we are facing now is different. The war in Ukraine is not going to di disappear tomorrow. Energy prices, they will be high for quite some time to come. And if we look at the disruption of supply chains, we have moved from a world where we were very happy with just-in-time delivery on global scale to just-in-case delivery and the product just do not arrive and that is very costly and even more importantly we need to finance a transition of our economy and we need to stop climate change that is going to cost a lot of money that is not a temporary challenge like the pandemic that will be with us for many years and public funds are limited and that is why and that's my link to the banking sector that's why we need now strong banks, strong capital markets, more than ever before. I see that European policymakers understand that, generically speaking. What we need now is we need to translate that into rules that allow the banking sector in Europe really to, to be able to respond properly to these challenges that I just described. And if I may, just one last thought, because I was saying, I'm seeing here Nicolas Thierry sitting in front of us. We spoke a lot about the European market. Nicolas has very large German operations. I've never discussed that with him, but it would be an interesting question to hear how happy he is with his economies of scale for being one of the largest German banks, or how unhappy he is, it is because Today, it costs him a lot of money. There is additional complexity. He cannot move capital liquidity from Germany to France the way he would like to do. Um, when we discuss it, it has a bit of a theoretical nature. Um, Nicolas lives this European market or lack of European market. He's one of the largest German banks. Just a word of conclusion, and then uh, we'll stop, and we're going to go on with the second panel, the issue which was not at all a uh, contentional debate here. My, uh, the, uh, well, journalists are not stakeholders. They're spe passive spectators uh, watching other people's lives and trying to understand. Sigurds, your microphone. Question. Uh, we're going from France to Germany to Denmark, so of course I represent both from economic perspective, maybe also policy background. 
the tough guys. So I made two years ago a very simple diagram where was public debt when the crisis erupted in 2008 for all European countries and who have remained more like to remain in the same space now as in 2008. Many countries, Germany even, decreased public debt over the last 20 years. A number of other countries consistently increased public debt, public debt, public debt, and ended up, including this country, in GDP ratios above 100 and some even further up. There is no way that can continue. There is no way, at the end of the day, that you will create a solidarity based on that these debt can be consumed and paid by someone else. So I think there is a basic issue of reforms of labor market and pension systems in these countries that need to take place, irrespectively. And if you think about it, these countries have been saved enormous amount of money by the monetary policies of the EUP. So some of these countries will see in five years' time debt serving as a share of GDP going from up with four or five percentage points. They'll be bankrupt unless they do something in the meantime. So there needs to be something taking place there. But it didn't go back to the point Christian had. Given the fact that public for finance will be constrained, what areas of the way the green transformation can take place should and could be delivered by the private sector, by financial institutions, combination of banks, pension funds, and so on and so forth. And there are a huge amount of investments in this space that needs to be done by the private sector and basically on market, uh, market uh, means and supported by green tax policy and so forth. So I don't think there's necessarily a lot of money needed from the public sector. It's also about being smart about the financing and the structural conditions around that, not only because that's the right way to do it, but also for the simple reason that if the countries I speak about here starts dealing with the financial questions that are in those countries, there won't be a lot of surplus spending from the state. So it needs to be financed by the private sector, and it also should be, lastly. Voilà, merci beaucoup à tous les trois, Maya Tig, Christian Ossig et à Sigur Snes Schmidt. Merci beaucoup. Pour, euh, merci euh, infiniment euh, à vous, je pense euh, vous trois. Parce que, euh, Thank you very much pour, merci uh, to all of our guests for this uh, uh, to our round table panelists uh, here. Seconde, uh, we are going to now move to the second uh, round table with these uh, burning questions for the future. Obviously, the economic, uh, the, uh, environmental transition and Tellement important. Uh, obviously, the uh, significant financial uh, movement, so a couple of figures, uh, 3 to 350 uh, billion euros just for the uh, ecological transition uh, uh, and uh, for the digital transition as well. This is a huge amount of money uh, for Europe as well. How are we going to fund this? How is this going to be financed? This will be the topic for the next roundtable. Thank you to our three guests. <laughs>